Welcome to Volunteer to Save a Life. This is the Tennessee Overdose Education and Naloxone Distribution Programming for the Healthcare Professional. I'm Sarah Melton, Professor of Pharmacy Practice at the Gatton College of Pharmacy at East Tennessee State University. This programming is brought to you in collaboration with Dr. David Kursky, Regional Medical Director with the Tennessee Department of Health at the Northeast Tennessee Regional Health Office. The organizations and persons participating in this educational program do not have a financial interest arrangement or affiliation with one or more organizations that could be perceived as a real or apparent conflict of interest in the context of the subject of this presentation. Supporting organizations for this programming include the Bill Gatton College of Pharmacy at East Tennessee State University, Generation Rx Committee Program, in collaboration with the College of Public Health, supported by grant funding from the Tennessee Department of Health. By the end of this education session, the learner should be able to explain the epidemiology of opioid overdose in Tennessee, describe the Naloxone Rescue Act of Tennessee and the associated Good Samaritan protection, examine risk factors associated with opioid overdose, incorporate overdose prevention education and naloxone rescue kits into medical and pharmacy practice by educating patients about overdose risk reduction and by furnishing naloxone rescue kits. Let's start by looking at the epidemiology of opioid prescribing and overdose. As you know, the United States consumes twice as many opioids per capita than the next closest nation. Tennessee is the number two state in the number one country. Alabama is the number one state for the number of opioids prescribed per capita by a tenth of a point. West Virginia is a distant third. If we look at the whole state of Tennessee, the eastern part of Tennessee is the number one region in the state. If we look at all of the states in the United States and look at Tennessee with the dark purple color, this looks at the number of painkiller prescriptions per 100 people, and this is ranked at 96 to 143. The highest rates include Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Arkansas. So Tennessee really is surrounded as well by high prescribing states. Here we're looking at the opioid overdose death rates per 10,000 population for the years 2013 to 2014. Again, the highest rates are noted by the very dark red color here, and clearly the eastern part of Tennessee has the highest opioid overdose deaths. And unfortunately, these deaths continue to rise in Tennessee. If we look at this graph, that looks at the drug overdose deaths in Tennessee from 2011 to 2015, it's clear that these rates continue to climb each year, with 1,451 persons dying from a drug overdose death in the year 2015. This chart looks at the causes of death in Tennessee for the year 2014. To put things in perspective, Drug overdose deaths follow only diabetes and pneumonia and flu and leads numbers of death over firearm discharge and motor vehicle accidents. These maps look at the morphine milligram equivalents dispensed and reported to the controlled substance database in Tennessee. Map number four looks specifically at all opioid morphine milligram equivalents dispensed and reported to the Prescription Monitoring Program in 2014. The darker the color red, the higher the rate. Again, we're looking at Eastern Tennessee. So very high doses prescribed here. If we look at buprenorphine, partial agonist opioid used in the treatment of opioid use disorder, we see similar things here in eastern Tennessee. Obviously, the higher doses of buprenorphine that have been prescribed and reported to the Controlled Substance Database are located in eastern Tennessee. 
This figure looks at the compilation of heroin indicators in Tennessee over a period of time from 2009 to 2014. This looks at drug seizures, admissions for treatment, crimes, arrests, and poisonings. Clearly, from 2011, in every one of these indicators, we're seeing dramatic increases that continue even unto today. So let's switch gears now and let's talk about the Naloxone Rescue Act. Legislatively, this came about through Senate Bill 1631 and House Bill 1427 and became effective in July 2014. The Naloxone Rescue Act allows a licensed healthcare practitioner to prescribe naloxone to a person at risk of having an opioid-related overdose or to a family member or a friend of the at-risk individual. The act does require training and administration of naloxone before the drug being prescribed and dispensed. This act did include Good Samaritan Protection, which provides immunity from civil prosecutions for both the prescribing practitioner and the layperson or individual who's administering the naloxone. Tennessee has a collaborative practice agreement. The purpose of this collaborative practice agreement was to reduce morbidity and mortality related to opioid overdoses in Tennessee. The pharmacist is considered to be uniquely positioned to support this public health initiative to get naloxone in the hands of the persons that need it because they are the most accessible practitioners. Pharmacists have a unique access to patients with pharmacists being located close to most patients in the state of Tennessee. In addition, pharmacists have the knowledge and skills to help reduce the consequences of opioid overdoses. Through the collaborative practice agreement, the pharmacist is allowed to prescribe naloxone to at-risk individuals and or family or friends of an at-risk individual or any other person in a position to assist the person at risk of experiencing an opioid-related overdose. Through the collaborative practice agreement, persons that are seeking to obtain naloxone are required to complete the proper education that could be online through the Tennessee Department of Health or through an approved education program such as this one. The collaborative practice agreement establishes the protocol that allows pharmacists to initiate a prescription for an opioid antagonist or naloxone to at-risk individuals by the chief medical officer for the Tennessee Department of Health. This collaborative practice agreement is located online for download at this link. So what are patient indications for persons that should be able to receive the naloxone through the collaborative practice agreement? These would include persons who voluntarily request naloxone and who are current illicit or non-medical opioid users or persons with a history of illicit or non-medical opioid use, persons with a history of opioid intoxication or overdose, and or recipients or emergency medical care for acute opioid poisoning, persons with a high dose opioid prescription, and that would be for more than 15 morphine milligram equivalents per day, persons with an opioid prescription and known or suspected concurrent alcohol use, or a person with an opioid prescription and concurrent prescriptions for benzodiazepines, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or tricyclic antidepressants. Other patient indications include persons who voluntarily request naloxone and who are released prisoners from correctional facilities, persons released from opioid detoxification and mandatory abstinence programs, persons entering methadone maintenance treatment programs, and that would be for the treatment of addiction or for pain, persons with opioid prescription and smoking or COPD or other respiratory illnesses or obstruction, Persons with an opioid prescription who also suffer from renal dysfunction, hepatic disease, cardiac disease, or from HIV or AIDS. What are non-patient indications for relieving naloxone? These would include family or friends of an at-risk individual or any other person in a position to assist the person at risk of experiencing an opioid-related overdose. 
pain management clinics, primary care or ambulatory care clinics, local health departments, school or other educational institutions, a harm reduction organization, emergency medical services technicians, first responders, law enforcement officers or agencies, and an agent of a mental health or substance abuse treatment facility. Let's move into talking about what are some commonly abused opioids. Commonly abused opioids include the commonly prescribed medications including hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, codeine, fentanyl, hydromorphone, oxymorphone, meperidine, methadone, and buprenorphine. Heroin is included in this list because it is an opioid, and as you've seen earlier, we are having dramatically increased numbers of opioid overdose deaths attributed to heroin that could be combined with fentanyl or carfentanil. It's important for us as healthcare providers to be familiar with the street names associated with these opioids. Patients you may interact with may actually call the opioid by the street name, and you want to know what they're talking about. For example, Hydrocodone may be called on the street as hydro, norcos, vikes, or watsons. watsons. Oxycodone may be called ox, oxys, roxies, oxycotton, kicker, or hillbilly heroin. Morphine may be called M, Miss Emma, monkey, or white stuff. And then fentanyl is often called Apache, China Girl, China White, Goodfella, or TNT. It's important to note that heroin is often referred to as dope, smack, big H, black tar, and buprenorphine, commonly used to treat opioid use disorders, are called sobos, bup, stops, stop signs, and oranges related to the colors of the tablets or the films. Special notes should be made for methadone. Patients or persons on the street often call this meth. This can often be misinterpreted as methamphetamine as they both are called meth at times. Make sure you clarify if the person is discussing methadone, which is an opioid, or methamphetamine, which is a stimulant, amphetamine. Methadone is also referred to as junk, fizzes, dolls, or jungle juice, referring to the liquid formulation that is provided at methadone treatment facilities. What are common risk factors for opioid overdose? Some of the most common risk factors for opioid overdose include loss of tolerance. So this usually occurs when abstinence occurs. So when someone could be released from incarceration where they've detoxed while they've been imprisoned and then they have lost their tolerance when they come out, tend to use again at the same amount of opioid that they used before. And of course that puts them at high risk for overdose. The same thing can happen in a person in recovery who has relapsed after a period of abstinence, and those that have completed detox, perhaps in an inpatient facility, and they have lost their tolerance as well, relapse, and go on to use a large amount that they're no longer tolerant to. Other risk factors include those that have had a previous overdose. So any patient that you work with that you're aware of an overdose this is the number one risk factor. They should always have naloxone available. But it's well known that many people prescribed opioids or those that abuse opioids have a risk of a second overdose after the first. Anyone with a history of addiction has a risk factor for overdose. Those that are changing opioid dose or perhaps changing impurity that could be associated with heroin and what it would be cut with, perhaps fentanyl making it more potent off the street. Also, that includes patients that are being prescribed fast-acting opioids or immediate-release opioids and are changed to long-acting opioids, which of course have a higher amount of opioid per tablet. One of the most common risk factors we see for overdose, but supported by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, are those that mix substances or have polypharmacy. So combining opioids with alcohol or benzodiazepines such as Xanax, Ativan, and others like Clonopin, 
or other respiratory depressants, which might include tricyclic antidepressants, antipsychotics such as quetiapine or Seroquel. Chronic medical illnesses also put the person at risk, especially if they already have lung disease, including COPD, sleep apnea, or asthma, and those that have liver and renal compromise because they are unable to metabolize or excrete the opioid as they normally would. We know those that use opioids alone that are in social isolation have a higher risk for overdose. That's because no one is there to call for help. Other risk factors include changing from immediate release to long-acting opioids, being prescribed more than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day, comorbid mental illness, especially that of depression, is associated with the higher risk of overdose, those that are receiving prescriptions from multiple pharmacies and prescribers, so doctor and pharmacy shopping, and those that are receiving a methadone prescription, secondary to the long half-life and complicated pharmacodynamic interactions and, and pharmacokinetic interactions. It's important for the healthcare provider, as well as the layperson, to be clear on the difference between what is being high and what does a person look like in an overdose situation. So let's make sure we understand these clearly. A person that is high from opioids often has relaxed muscles, they have impaired speech, so their speech is going to be slow or slurred. They will appear drowsy, lethargic, often nodding off. However, they will be responsive to you to verbal or painful stimuli, but they will have a normal heart rate and normal skin tone. That's in contrast with the person who is overdosed, who will have pale and clammy skin. Their breathing will be infrequent or perhaps absent. As we get to the end of the overdose before death, you may hear a snoring or a gurgling, which is often known as the death rattle. These persons are unresponsive to any stimuli, and this would include stimuli such as shaking a shoulder and ask, calling their name and asking if they're okay, pinching the earlobe. I ask for you to pinch your earlobe tightly now so that you can see how much pain that can cause to cause a response or doing a sternal rub where you would take your fist and take your knuckles and run it up and down your sternum. So do that so you can see how much pain that can cause. Most people that will be high, of course, would respond in an overdose situation, they would not. Also in an overdose situation, the person may have a slow or absent heart rate. And often cyanosis or blue coloring will be present around the lips and the fingertips, indicating a lack of oxygenation. The key point is that persons in a state of overdose are unresponsive to any stimuli. So what happens with an opioid overdose? Causes include reduced sensitivity to changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide outside of normal ranges, decreased tidal volume and respiratory frequency, and eventually respiratory failure and death because of hypoventilation. The overdose scenario develops over minutes to hours. We see decreased respiratory rate, decreased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, and body temperature. The person goes into a state of unresponsiveness. They have meiosis or pinpoint pupils and blue and gray lips and nails, again from the cyanosis from lack of oxygenation. There are many myths that exist on the street on how to reverse an opioid overdose. So we as healthcare professionals must educate our patients about these. First, do not put the person in a bath. They're unconscious, so putting them into a bath could cause them to drown. Do not induce vomiting or give them something to drink. They could choke and aspirate the vomit into their lungs. Do not put the person in an ice bath or put ice in any orifice because cooling the body temperature down can further depress the heart rate and accelerate the overdose and death process. 
person should be educated not to stimulate the person in any way that can cause harm. That includes slapping, kicking, or punching the person in an overdose situation. We know aggressive actions can cause long-term physical damage. It's important that persons understand that they should not inject the overdose victim with any foreign substance, such as salt water or milk. This could lead to severe infections of the skin, heart, virus transmissions, abscesses, and other things. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist. It works by reversibly binding to mu receptors, and naloxone has a greater affinity for mu receptors than opioids. With regard to pharmacokinetic properties, the half-life is approximately 64 minutes. It undergoes glucuronidation in the liver and is excreted in the urine. If we look at the pharmacology of naloxone, we actually have the opioid receptor here, which typically the opioid molecule, such as heroin, would typically come in and bind to this just perfectly, causing an opioid response, such as decreased pain, sedation, or overdose if we have too many opioids um, present in the brain. In an overdose situation, when naloxone is administered intranasally or through the intramuscular route, Naloxone has a much stronger affinity to the opioid receptor than the opioid molecule. So it knocks all the heroin off the receptor for a short period of time and allows the person to breathe again. It should be noted that naloxone takes about 30 to 45 seconds to work and it lasts for about 30 to 45 minutes. There are some concerns that are often reported in the newspaper or in media about naloxone. You should remember that naloxone has no abuse potential. This is not a controlled substance. Some people feel that naloxone allows people who abuse to take more opioid without fear. This really has not been shown in the literature. Anyone who has worked with the person with the disease of addiction knows that each day what they're trying to avoid is going into a painful withdrawal situation. When naloxone precipitates withdrawal, it happens very quickly and is a very painful process. So persons with addiction would not want to risk having to be administered naloxone. It should be known that naloxone has no effect if accidentally administered or self-administered to someone that's not taking opioids. For example, a child. Now we're going to switch gears and go into how to respond to an opioid overdose. There are very clear defined steps that should be followed during this process. Step one is to check for responsiveness. Again, we do this by calling out the person's name and asking if they're okay while tapping their shoulder, by pinching the earlobe, or by doing the sternal rub. If the person is found to be unresponsive or having very shallow or irregular breathing, we need to go on to step two. Step two is the administration of naloxone. We're going to talk about each one of the products and how they can be administered intranasally or intramuscularly. When naloxone is administered, within 30 seconds to about three minutes, if the person has overdosed on an opioid, the person will have withdrawal effects. This typically includes diaphoresis, vomiting, diarrhea, pain, and other effects. It should be noted that while rare, a person that goes into withdrawal may become very combative, and it's important for the rescuer to protect themselves. After the naloxone is given, they would step back. Again, this rarely happens, um, but you, the person that's a lay person rescue should be aware of the possibility. The next step would be to place the person into the recovery position. If you look at the diagram here, 
The recovery position allows the rescuer to move the person in an overdose situation onto their side. This allows in any case of vomiting or other situation that they cannot roll back onto their back. So to do this, you're gonna lift the head back and lift the chin to open the airway, turn the person onto their side and place the hand underneath the chin. Take the bended knee and place it against the floor and you will be able to tilt the head back to check on breathing and be able to safely call 911 emergency medical services and wait until they arrive. The next step is to call 911. You may be in a situation that can be chaotic. Step out of the room as long as you have the person in the recovery position. Be calm and collected as you talk to the emergency medical services operator. Be sure to give all details pertinent to the situation, including telling them that you have an unresponsive person that is not breathing. Try to give the exact address. Have the person lying in an area where it's easy for emergency medical personnel to access them uh, easily to provide treatment. If you're outside, please direct them to pertinent landmarks so they can easily locate you. The next step would be to initiate rescue breathing or CPR. CPR would be given if the person is certified or as instructed by the 911 operator, if the person has not started breathing or if there is an absent heartbeat. The final step is to assess and respond based on the outcome of that first naloxone administration. Assessing and responding is a very important part of the steps to the overdose recovery. If the person recovers after the first dose of naloxone, you should continue to monitor them until emergency medical services arrive. At this time, you will want to calm and soothe the overdose victim. Often, they may be agitated and they will want to take more drugs. Do not allow them to take any more drugs or to eat or drink anything. You should emphasize the importance of waiting for emergency medical services to arrive so that they can be assessed. Assure them that opioid withdrawal is not life-threatening and that the naloxone will wear off in 30 to 45 minutes. It's important to note, however, that depending on what substance that they were taking, they could relapse back into overdose once the first dose of naloxone wears off. This is commonly seen with the drug methadone. There are two circumstances in which you may need to administer a second dose of naloxone. In circumstance A, if the individual has not responded to the initial dose within three minutes, or circumstance B, if the individual has relapsed into an overdose again after having previously recovered with the initial dose of naloxone. There are often questions about CPR or compressions that should be used in naloxone rescue. The American Heart Association and their 2015 guidelines integrated naloxone administration with chest compressions. This is still controversial, but it appears rescue breathing alone results in worse outcomes compared when compressions only are given with naloxone administration. So we tend to instruct the layperson that's trained in CPR to use the American Heart Association guidelines. Here's the algorithm that was published in 2015. And so you can see that assess the patient and activate beginning the CPR if they're unresponsive with no breathing or only gasping. Then comes the administering the naloxone, where you may repeat that after the four minutes. Three minutes is also acceptable. Now we're going to discuss each one of the products. We're gonna start with intranasal naloxone that is available in an FDA formulation, the Narcan nasal spray, and also in the formulation that we have to convert with a nasal atomizer. 
For the lure lock jet naloxone that many of us are familiar with being available in the hospital to give as an injection, these are the steps that you will need to go through to convert this to be used as an intranasal product. The first step is to take the syringe out of the box and pull or pry off each one of the yellow caps on the ends of the syringe. The second step is to pull off the cap off the naloxone capsule or vial. The third step is to take the nasal atomizer that would be dispensed by the pharmacist, hold it by the butterfly wings, and screw it on to the syringe. The next step is you're going to take the naloxone capsule and gently screw that into the barrel of the syringe. You're now ready to insert the white cone into one side of the nose in one nostril. You're going to give a short, vigorous push on the end of the capsule to spray naloxone into the nose. And it's important to note that one half of the contents of the capsule will go into each nostril. If there's no reaction in two to five minutes, you should give the second dose. You should notice here that the naloxone capsule has the markings here so that you can tell exactly how much is half. This would be two milliliters, so one milliliter would go into the left nostril, one milliliter into the right nostril. So this is the nasal spray. There are three parts. The atomizer, the plastic tube, and the naloxone. First, you're going to take the yellow parts off the top and the bottom of the plastic tube. You're going to remove the purple cap on the naloxone. You're going to take the atomizer and hold it by its plastic wings, and you're going to twist that into the plastic tube. What if you held it by the white bit? It's better to hold it by the plastic wings so it doesn't break. You're then going to take the medication and twist that into the end of the plastic tube. You don't want to twist too tight, but just enough until you get resistance. This is glass, so you want to be careful that it doesn't break and twist too hard. You're going to then spray the naloxone half of the tube into one nostril and the other half into the other nostril until the naloxone is completely administered. For the FDA-approved intranasal naloxone marketed under the brand name Narcan, this is available in 2 and 4 milligrams of naloxone hydrochloride in 0.1 milliliter, so significantly more concentrated and less liquid than the, the naloxone with the nasal atomizer. It's important when the Narcan nasal spray is used to seek emergency medical care immediately after use as we described. This will be a single spray of naloxone nasal spray to adults or pediatric patients intranasally into just one nostril. If a second dose has to be administered, you would use a new nasal spray with each dose. If the patient did not respond or responds and then relapses back into respiratory depression, additional doses of the naloxone may be given every two to three minutes until emergency medical assistance arrives. And of course, rescue breathing measures would be helpful while awaiting for emergency assistance. Now we're going to move into talking about the intramuscular naloxone products. On the left is the auto injector marketed under the brand name FZO. On the right are the commonly prescribed naloxone vials of 0.4 milligram per cc that would be dispensed with needles. The FDA approved naloxone auto injector comes with a trainer that the patient or lay rescuer can practice with as often as they would like. It comes with two of the actual product with the naloxone in it. So every naloxone prescribed would have two doses available in it. The actual product also talks the lay rescuer through the entire process. Should be noted when FZO first came to market, it was marketed as 0.4 milligrams. This is no longer being produced. The new dose is two milligrams. The naloxone auto injector has visual and voice instructions that help guide the user through the injection process. 
Each auto injector contains only one dose of medicine. The first step would be to pull the auto injector from the outer case. You do not want to go on to remove the red safety guard until you are ready to use the auto injector. If you're not ready to use the auto injector, you need to put it back in the outer case for later use. The second step is to pull off the red safety guard. To reduce the chance of an accidental in injection, do not touch the black base of the auto injector because that's where the needle comes out. If an accidental injection happens, you should get medical help right away. Note, the red safety guard is made to fit very tightly. You must pull firmly to remove it. You do not replace the red safety guard after it is removed. Third step is to place the black end of the middle of the outer thigh. This can be injected through clothing, such as the pants, jeans, etc. And then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. It's important to note that if you have to give naloxone via the auto injector to an infant that's less than one year old, please pinch the middle of the outer thigh before you give the naloxone and continue to pinch while you administer naloxone by the auto injector. While watching this video, make sure to note the distinct sound, which is a click and hiss. This indicates that the auto injector is working properly. You should also note that the needle will inject and then automatically retract back up into the device so that there is no risk for a needle stick. Let's demonstrate the auto injector. Okay. So your prescription would come with two of these devices as well as a trainer that looks like this. There are written instructions as well as audio. You can pull the top off. This trainer contains no needle or drug. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. And that's how it works. Thank you so much for taking the time to demonstrate it for me. Absolutely. For the intramuscular naloxone assembly and administration when vials and needles are dispensed, the first step is to remove the cap from the naloxone vial. You will then insert the needle through the rubber stopper with the vial upside down. The layperson should be instructed to pull back the plunger and withdraw one milliliter. The next step is to inject that one milliliter of naloxone into the upper arm or the thigh muscle. If there is no response in two to three minutes, the layperson should give the second dose following the same steps. Let me demonstrate the muscular injection for you. Okay. So there are two parts for this one, the naloxone and the intramuscular syringe. You're going to remove the cap from the naloxone, take the cap off the needle. Ooh, that's a big needle. It's actually the same one that we use for giving vaccinations, even here at the pharmacy. You're going to place the needle into the medication, draw up one cc into the syringe here. And you're going to place this needle into a large muscle, the arm, the leg, and push the medication into the victim. Sound okay? Yeah, I think I could do that. Great. When discussing storage of naloxone with the lay rescuer, they should be instructed to store the naloxone in the original package at room temperature. You should avoid light exposure, so not keeping it in a window or in the car would be important. The shelf life of naloxone is generally about a year to 18 months upon dispensing. It's important to educate the lay rescuer not to insert naloxone into the pre-filled syringe, so that would be with the nasal atomizer or with the needles uh, for the intramuscular injection, until they're ready to use.
Once it's inserted into the pre-filled syringe, it expires within two weeks. It's important for the layperson to monitor the expiration date on that naloxone product and replace it before it expires. However, when there are no other alternatives, expired naloxone can be administered, but just realize it may not be quite as effective. But some naloxone is better than no naloxone. In community dispensing arena, for the intranasal naloxone, two doses of the two milligram per two cc pre-filled lure lock ready needleless syringes should be dispensed. The NDC number is available there. Also, the nasal atomization devices should be dispensed with the product. As you may know, last year these nasal atomization devices were recalled. We're having a very difficult time accessing them at the current time. So you may have patients that are unable to access this formulation easily. The patient information pamphlet with the overdose prevention information and the step-by-step -step instructions for overdose responses and naloxone administration should always be provided. It's also recommended that the patient or the lay rescuer be provided with latex-free gloves and disposable face shield mask for the rescue breathing. For the intramuscular naloxone, they will be provided two doses of the 0.4 milligram per cc single dose 1 ml vials. Again, the NDC number is provided there. They may also be provided with the multi-dose 10 milliliter flip top vial. They should also be given two intramuscular syringes that are 23 gauge, three cc's and one inch needles. Again, patient information pamphlet with all the overdose prevention information and the step-by-step -step instructions for the overdose response and how to administer the naloxone should be provided. It's also recommended that alcohol swabs, gloves, preferably latex-free gloves be provided, as well as the disposable face shield mask for rescue breathing. There are certain requirements the recipients of naloxone should receive. Pharmacists are required to provide education to the recipients that address, at the minimum, these topics. They include the online overdose prevention education program offered by the Department of Health or an improved layperson training, the purpose for naloxone, the correct way to administer it, precautions regarding medications that may interact with the naloxone, and what are high-risk overdose situations, what are ways to reduce risk, an appropriate response to the overdose, including rescue breathing and calling 911. Documentation is key. Pharmacists are required to document each recipient's participation by following these procedures. They should record the name of the recipient, the date the drug was dispensed, the NDC code for the medication dispensed, and the name and title of the person providing the medica medication as well as the education. At the request of the Tennessee Department of Health, the pharmacist should be able to provide written notification through electronic or other transmittal processes to the authorizing physician within, within seven days of initiating the therapy with an opioid antagonist, and they must maintain these records for 10 years. The pharmacist should contact the chief medical officer or his designee in the event that the pharmacist requires medical consultation for a particular patient. At the request of the Tennessee Department of Health, the pharmacist should provide all documentation required and of the education or waiver of education given to the recipient of the medication upon request and within 10 business days of such request. Let's look at the cost. These costs um, are accurate up until the end of August 2017 from GoodRx.com. Should be noted that the intranasal naloxone, the two, two milligram per two cc pre-filled syringes can be obtained for about $80 in cash cost. The FDA approved naloxone nasal spray available in two and four milligrams cost approximately $140 cash. The naloxone syringe for intramuscular injection with the 2.4 milligram per cc vials is the least expensive option at about 
dollars. However, this has not been a popular option among uh, lay rescuers just because of the risk of needle sticks and the high prevalence of hepatitis C and HIV in this population. The uh, FDA approved naloxone auto injector that is available at two milligrams per two cc now cost is over $4,000. I will refer you to the manufacturer's website though because you will be able to obtain copay, copay discount cards as well as access the prescription um, patient assistance program there. So I'm going to take you there so you can see what this looks like. Um, through Kaleo uh, for the FZO program, it's called Kaleo Cares Patient Assistance Program. The form will be filled out with the patient information, their insurance and income attestation, and uh, consent. Should be noted. Um, that the criteria for this patient assistance program is that they must be a legal U.S. resident. They do not have government or commercial drug coverage. Um, they cannot be eligible for such insurance as Medicare or TRICARE and have an annual income less than $100,000. So actually these criteria probably apply to many of the patients all of us work with. So income less than $100,000 uh, without any kind of health or prescription insurance. With regard to access in the pharmacy, Tennessee is one of many states that allows dispensing of naloxone by a pharmacist through the collaborative practice agreement that we talked about earlier. And this is key because it allows a layperson to access naloxone without visiting a doctor. The pharmacist is uniquely positioned to support public health initiatives because of the frontline access to the public. The standing order we talked about earlier establishes the protocol that allows the pharmacist to dispense naloxone containing products to at-risk individuals by the standing order from an authorized prescriber. There are some very helpful resources that will be valuable to you in your practice. I recommend you go to the Tennessee Department of Health information on naloxone. The link is provided there. The College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists have developed a very helpful PD, downloadable PDF that um, is titled Naloxone Access, Practical Guidelines for Pharmacists, but obviously any prescriber will find this information very valuable as well. The videos that I showed you today in this education session came from welcome to prescribe to prevent.org. You can access this website at prescribetoprevent.org. There's multiple important patient education initiatives that are um, available there and downloadable and printable forms that you can use in your practice. I encourage you to use them. I will also state with regard to access for naloxone, TenCare does cover the intranasal naloxone product for um, their beneficiaries, and so it should be easily accessible for those patients with TenCare. We are seeing more and more commercial insurance companies come on board to pay for um, the naloxone products, especially the, the intranasal products, and you may have to do a prior authorization. Most people that have an opioid in their profile, however, the commercial insurance tends to pay for. I'm leaving you with some key references with links to increase your learning and just to have access to a lot of the different resources that I talked about today, including the Tennessee website on naloxone administration, the collaborative practice agreement, um, different statistics on opioid prescribing in the United States, the prescribe to prevent website, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Overdose Prevention Toolkit, and then the links to the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the nasal spray as well as the auto injector. Thank you so much for participating in this educational session. Dr. Kursky and I invite you to contact us at any time via our emails. My phone number is available there as well. We look forward to working with each of you as you roll out your naloxone initiatives in your practice. Thank you for being a key part in addressing the opioid overdose crisis in Tennessee.